from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. A Piece of Linoleum by David H. Keller It was a plain case of suicide. The coroner absolutely refused to consider any other verdict, and Mrs. Harker had the profound sympathy of her neighbors. I can't explain it at all, she whispered to two of her friends. Just why John had to do a thing like that, when we were so happy, is beyond me. It would have been different if I hadn't been a kind, loving wife to him. I was more than a wife. I was a helpmate. Take this house, for example. Do you suppose for one moment it would belong to us and every cent paid on the mortgage if John Harker had been left to do it? Not in a hundred years. The first few weeks we were married and I found he was stopping at the station to buy flowers for the house on his way home. I knew what my duty was as a loving wife and I lost no time doing it. From that time on, I handled the paycheck. Of course, I gave him some spending money every week and saw to it that he had his evening paper after supper, but I wouldn't let him buy the paper on his way home, because he always must it so on the train and it never was fit to put on the shelves afterwards. But when I gave it to him after supper and spoke to him now and then about wrinkling it, it hardly got must at all. If we had had children, I wouldn't have been able to take such good care of him and the house and the furniture. But before we married, the doctor told me I was delicate and better off without the responsibility of maternity. He was so sweet about it when he said I could look on my future husband as my baby. Of course, it was hard for John to understand. So many men do not have the feminine viewpoint. But he finally submitted to the inevitable, though he always failed to see why I decorated his bedroom in pink. Being alone all day gave me lots of time for sewing, and in a few years I was making all my own clothes and most of John's. He used to ask me to buy his shirts, told me I was too busy to spend time on them. But I told him I just loved to do things like that for him, and that he was all the baby I had. So by and by, he stopped talking about it. I studied his health, even sent to Washington for special books on invalid feeding. And if in the 20 years of our sweet married life, John Harker ever ate a spoonful of anything that was not pure and wholesome and fit for a man of his weight and digestive peculiarities, he must have bought at a restaurant. He never ate it at his own table. I was always careful about his health. Every morning, the same thing. Remind him of his umbrella, be sure he had his rubbers on, and the right weight of underwear. If it was clear in the morning and damp at night, I would meet his car with a raincoat and overshoes. Nothing was too much trouble for me. And I kept a clean house for him. That wasn't easy to do with a man in it. What he did not know, I taught him, patiently, just as you would a little child. It took over two years to train him to come in the back door, take off his shoes in the woodshed, and put on his carpet slippers before he came into the house. But patience and love and repetition finally helped him to form the habit. We had lovely carpets, beautiful things that would last three generations if properly cared for. And when I found out how careless he was, I put squares of linoleum around where he was in the habit of sitting. And when his friends came in and he would forget himself and ask them to smoke, I would always run and put a piece of linoleum under them so the ashes wouldn't get on the floor. I was delicate and nervous after I was 30. The dear doctor thought it was the change of life 
working on me, so I suggested that John save me by washing the supper dishes every night. But do you know, he was so careless that I had to put several pieces of linoleum where he was working, or he would get drops of soapy water on the beautiful waxed floor. I let him have his recreation. Once a year, I insisted on his attending a meeting of his lodge of lofty pine trees, even though he would smell of cigar smoke when he came back. But I was patient with him and never threw it up to him how hard I had to work to get the smell out of his best suit. At last, I used lavender and heliotrope alternately, and finally, when he wore the suit to church, you could not smell anything but the perfume. It seems that the lodge appreciated what kind of loving wife John Harker had because the floral piece they sent to the funeral was perfectly lovely. Perhaps you ladies noticed it. I placed it in a conspicuous place at the head of the coffin. It was a large pillow made of little daisies with the words at peace worked out in violets. And of course, you want to know just how it happened? You realize that in my delicate health, we always had separate bedrooms. But as a dear doctor said, every husband has his rights. And so I never once shut the door between the rooms at night. I will say this, that John was a gentleman and never once took advantage of my kindness. You see, I told him right after we were married, just what the doctor said about any sudden shock being likely to kill me. And of course, he realizing how delicate I was, didn't want to have my health or my death on his conscience. I had his room decorated in pink and on the wall facing the bed, just where he could see it the last thing at night and the first thing in the morning, I had an enlarged picture of us on our first trip to Atlantic City. Me on a chair and he in back, standing, holding an umbrella over me to protect my complexion from the sun. You know how sacred such experiences are during the first weeks of matrimony. He had a nice single bed and kept it and the room scrupulously clean. There was a piece of linoleum by the side of the bed, and on it I had a Chinese spittoon hand-painted with tea roses. I gave it to him before we were married. Of course, he wasn't vulgar enough to chew or smoke, though goodness knows he might have formed such habits had he been married to any other kind of woman, but he was fond of chewing gum. So every night I let him have one stick, and the instructions were for him to put the wad in the spittoon just before he went to sleep. When I was well, I used to turn the light out for him. But the nights of my martyrdom from headaches, I made him put himself to bed. The dear doctor says that just as soon as I change, the headaches will stop, and I hope they do. No one who isn't married knows just what a terrible thing it is to be a woman. This night, I went over his weekly allowance with him and explain how by drinking chicory instead of coffee, I had saved three dollars and had spent it for a new piece of art linoleum for his bedroom. It had the loveliest design on it, a cupid shooting an arrow at a trembling deer, symbolic of married life. I told him and explained that it was a female deer, and that was why it was trembling. He did not say much, but later on his light went out and he said, Good night. I knew right away there was something wrong because I had always taught him to say good night dear with his loving emphasis on the last word. Later on I heard a drip 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 and I knew right away that either a tap was leaking or that it was raining a little and I called John did you turn off the tap tight in the bathroom and he just laughed and told me everything was all right and to go to sleep and not worry. The drip, drip, drip kept on, but fainter, so I went to sleep. When I went into his room to wake him so he could go down and get breakfast, for that was the way we divided the work, and it gave me a half hour more of necessary rest every day, I found the poor man had cut his wrist with a safety razor blade and was dead. What I heard dripping during the night was his life's blood. The doctor explained it all to me. He said that he was psychotic that no man who had a loving, tender wife like John Harker had would do a thing like that if he were not insane. That must be the explanation. One thing I am sure of, 
during all the 20 years of our sweet married life, he never learned to appreciate my efforts to give him a nice, clean home. Even at the end, he was careless. If he had just moved down in bed eight inches, he could have bled on the linoleum instead of on the lovely ingrained carpet.